My name is Doug Slabel, and I'm a retired history professor from St. Michael's College. And um, I wanted to say a few words about the history of the environment and then introduce our speaker today. Um, as some of you may be aware, before the 1960s, the environment was still something of a niche interest for most Americans. But in 1962, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring became a bestseller and alerted Americans to the dangers of the casual spreading of toxic chemicals in the environment. One of the most spectacular confirmations of the dangers of pollution came in 1969, when the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, long beset by industrial pollution, caught on fire. The brewing environmental movement became national with the celebration of the first Earth Day in 1970. Environmental mobilization led to the passage of a series of landmark laws in early, the early 1970s, including uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Water Act, the Strengthening of the Clean Air Act, and the Endangered Species Act. The blossoming of environmentalism was not lost on historians who were often affected by the changing currents in their societies to choose the subjects they study. Where political and military history had long dominated the profession, after 1970, the study of society and culture, including the interactions of human beings with the natural world became increasingly important. A book that grew out of this interest appeared in 1983 William Cronin's brilliant Changes in the Land, Indians, Colonists, and the Ecology of New England. Many historians, including me, found it revelatory in showing how conflicts over the use of the land were at the root of the settler native animosities of the colonial period. Because it works like Cronin's, the natural world has become an active, not just a passive factor in how historians have come to think about the past. For those of you who are interested in how this approach to history might apply to Vermont, let me recommend another book, Jan Albers' Hands on the Land, A Landscape History of Vermont. It's handsomely illustrated and beautifully written. It's not just informative, but a pleasure to read. Since the 1960s, threats to the environment have only grown, including the calamities associated with human-made climate change, which is why it is so important to have historians who can show us the roots of such changes in the past. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing about one of the most recent studies of humans interacting with the natural world. Professor Zachary Bennett will present his paper, Why We Should Blame New England's Fish for Capitalism. And let me say a little bit about Professor Bennett's background. He is now an assistant professor of history at Norwich University. He received his PhD from Rutgers University in 2019, and his research has been supported by the American Antiquarian Society, the Massachusetts Historical Society, and the Omohundro Institute of Early American Studies at the College of William and Mary. His publications have appeared in academic journals such as Early American Studies, and the New England Quarterly. Dr. Bennett's research interests lie in the environmental history of North America and the Atlantic world. Currently, he is completing a book manuscript entitled Contested Currents, which re-examines the history of New England from approximately 1000 to 1800 from the perspective of the region's many rivers. So let us welcome Professor Bennett affect the ecology of the surrounding area. So rivers are the, really the center of everything um, for an, from an environmental standpoint and also from um, a larger human one. But the thing is, is with uh, George Perkins Marsh, and I enjoyed the kind of early, um, the introduction about the early environmentalist movement here in the 20th century, but when we look at environmental change, it's usually you know, at the earliest the 19th century. But what I'm gonna talk about today is that, especially in places like New England, the vast majority of the changes took place in the 16 and 1700s. Um, and that's not looked at enough, and that's what we'll, I'll be talking about um, today. 
So next slide, please. OK. So the objectives today in terms of what I want to talk about are, um, first, why did New England's river fish disappear? When people think about fish in New England, we often think about the ocean. I'm not really going to be talking about that today. I'm going to be talking about the fish populations that migrated up New England's many rivers in the, uh, through, really up until the 19th century. New England is a very rocky, mountainous, hard place to live. But the one thing that it does have in abundance is water power and rivers. And uh, these fish were central to um, uh, people's lives through the early 19th century. And I'll talk more about that. If you're not so much in Vermont, but in other New England states and across the eastern seaboard, there's a lot of rest river restoration projects. And what they're trying to do is bring these fish populations back. And one of the questions is, is like, why did they leave in the first place? Why do we have to restore them? So I'm going to be kind of looking at why these fish disappeared in the first place. And also, in, in keeping with the title of what I'm talking about, is what does this story about fish disappearing help us understand this much bigger story and much more important story, which is about how does this story tell us about the rise of capitalism, the creation of the, the society and culture that we inhabit in the 21st century? Because I think by telling the story about fish in New England rivers, which is kind of quaint, we actually get a better idea of how society transitioned from like a moral economy to like the capitalist society that we, that we inhabit today. OK, so first off, capitalism, what is it? Uh, some people, I think it's in American politics, are either hooray or boo. People have strong opinions about capitalism. Um, it's, it's a, and it's also, but we never like, actually try to define it. And capitalism is actually a really difficult thing to define. Um, I think, and I don't think, a lot of scholars have agreed that capitalism is not just an economic system, as which is the way that we might conventionally think about it. But it's also a political, ideological, and cultural system as well. It's a mindset. Um, when people talk about capitalism in the 21st century and how they don't like it, or how that we should move to a, a kind of a political economy that is not capitalist, I personally don't have a lot of patience for those conversations because our society is so thoroughly capitalist and uh, has been created by that, that there is no option to not be capitalist. Even if you are socialist or something like that, it would still be framed in the very kind of capitalist system. That's not to say it's good or bad. It's just the world that we live in. It's, it's just important to recognize that this world has only been around for like 200 years. When I think about capitalism and what it is and trying to define it, and it's a very difficult thing to define, I, I, I think of it as a world that has abstracted everything into uh, numbers for the purpose of, of trade, of the specifically long distance trade. Um, we can see this in how we understand like how many of us get paid in terms of like fish or like wheat anymore. It's, it's a wage that we get paid in terms of when we think about retirement or investing. It's all a knowledge of numbers. A very much, so all like material things in the world are kind of abstracted into this numerical system to um, facilitate long distance global trade. And that's the, that's the world that we live in. So when a ship um, you know, in the Suez Canal gets stuck for a couple days, right? we can't buy toilet paper. Right? And so this is the kind of world that we live in, and just in, in question, without kind of question, but it's interesting to think about how weird that is. Um, and there is, you know, I think, good parts of capitalism and bad parts of it. Right? But um, a lot of people kind of look at this, the modern world that we live in and say, what was it like before capitalism? And how did we get to this point in the first place? I think, and so the world that I'm going to be talking about, which was the world in which the like, early colonial America was in the 15 and 1600s, was um, something called a moral economy. And that doesn't mean necessarily it was good when people were more moral then. It's more of, instead of like, so for the example, the expression of like, hey, it's not personal, it's just business, right? This is just a matter of the numbers. It's not a personal thing. That wasn't, a, an, it, that, that wasn't a thing before capitalism. It was more of like, this is the social hierarchy, the social value and the social community that we have. In all exchanges, the value is not so much like the worth of the item, but also the social value of these exchanges as well. Something that would, that's also in terms of that you can see in these, these uh, pre-capitalist societies in terms of how we would identify them is that most things that people consume are locally are locally sourced, OK? So trade is local. The things that you eat and purchase are all made locally. You might have two or three degrees of separation from pretty much everything that you own or possess. 
Um, and this is what predates uh, the capitalist system. The kind of image I have here is one of those items from Adam Smith's uh, Wealth of Nations, or it's kind of associated with it, which is the idea of like a division of labor, right? So it's like we all work in a factory and we make pins all day, and we the, by trading those pins we can live on them. Uh, if you just you can't survive on making pins, right? You have to like grow food and stuff. Um, and that was kind of an example of that. And I think when we look at a lot of like the people that we look at early economic thinkers like Adam Smith and Karl Marx, I think we mistake those people for having like really clear ideas about capitalism. They were more people who were living in the 18th and early 19th century who were observing the train changes that capitalism was, was wreaking on society, right? Um, and that's in general what makes capitalism hard to define because you don't, it's not, it's really hard to see its origins because um, it's only when it's there <laughs> and already the decisions have been made um, that capitalism's there. So the origins of capitalism is an is a interesting kind of question for historians, but a very important one because it's like the foundation of our world. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a couple of the characters that'll be, that I'll be discussing in this talk. First are New England's anadromous fish, uh, which are uh, the anadromous is a word for fish that live most of their lives in the ocean, but spawn in rivers. Um, and this was a very big part of New England's um, ecology and economy in the Native American world and then the old, also the early colonial world. Um, so basically, when we think of like migrations of animals, especially very large ones, we might think of like the buffalo that were in the American plains or passenger pitch pigeons. The migration of fish uh, up New England's rivers every spring was so immense and awesome uh, that first off, people, Europeans who observed them, this is one, one account, is he says that one could not throw a stone in the river that he would not hit a fish. And it seemed that the, fish, the river was so full of fish that he could walk across dry shot. That was the image of these fish migrations in the 1600s. And there are surviving uh, and somewhat healthy uh, fish migrations in places like Scandinavia. And scientists have determined that we might think of like, oh, those buffalo migrations, those were really big. These are just a couple fish. No, in terms of uh, biomass and energy, um, these are much larger um, than the, the buffalo of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the plains. We just, as human beings, notice the bison disappearing and not so much the fish because one is above ground and one is you know, underwater. But these were very important. And I've included some of the species here that uh, migrated or continue to migrate up New England's rivers. Um, Atlantic salmon, which is a very politically contentious and probably the most iconic fish. Very important in Vermont because they came all the way up the Connecticut River back in the day. Um, shad, I caught that shad actually on the left in the Kennebec River in Maine. Sturgeon and um, alewives or river herring, very, very small fish. So these are the major fish. They usually come up depending on whether you're in southern or northern New England in April um, and May. And even though, so even though uh, dams have been brought down in a couple states in the last 20 years, um, it's not nearly what the, what the migrations were historically, but already we're seeing millions and millions of fish recovering very quickly, which is a really kind of amazing thing um, to witness. And that's a very important part of their economy. One of the things that I want to mention too is that um, one third of people's protein, meat supply, through the early 1800s came from these type of fish. Also, New England's soil is very acidic. Um, in order to fertilize it, uh, to put nitrogen in the soil, these fish were essential uh, for farming at this time. So people's lives, life and death, was determined by the arrival of these fish in the spring, especially since um, in the spring, that's the, you know, coming out of the winter, like the period we're in right now, people are in a month or two, your food reserves are at the lowest. So the arrival of these fish was really a matter of, of life and death uh, for people who lived in New England before colonization and in the early centuries of it. Um, okay, next one, please. Okay, uh, to give you an example of like the change, like historians, what we, we look at is change over time, right? So... In my research in colonial America, at the beginning of the period I look at, say in like the 1600s, we're in a fairly pre-capitalist moral economy. By the 19th century, we're really in a capitalist world, um, at least in my opinion. One of the ways you can see this 
um, is how people interact with fish. And I'll just go, go through this real quick. On the left is, uh, was a petition from Dover, New Hampshire in 1644, where uh, their river, which is the Cochecho River um, in New Hampshire, they made rules about the fish migrations and who would be able to harvest them and how they would be distributed. So first off, the people who are called weirsmen, the people that operated the nets on the river, they were paid not in a wage, but in fish, right? Um, a more kind of barter economy. Um, her the herring that they caught, the alewives and the uh, and other and shad, they were sold at a common price. This idea of a just or fair price. So it's not the market that determines the price of the fish, but this idea of what is a just or fair price at that time. Um, and then also, these fish reinforce social hierarchies in the town. Uh, so for example, my favorite is the first salmon that is caught in the Cochecho River goes to the pastor. And then people who get turns at the weir to harvest these fish is in a very, um, very social hierarchical base. It's not equal access. First town and church officers get access to these, uh, to these fish, and then settlers or townspeople based on when you moved to Dover, okay? So it's not so much like this is a very valuable resource, these fish, but it's not like a price or a market price that is determining um, their value, right? Massachusetts in 1808, you can see this transformation uh, with a law that Massachusetts passes for um, all, if you're going to sell alewives or herring, it must be done in this way. And I'll read these quotes for you. They're kind of long. Boxes containing herring shall be made of good boards of no, not less than half inch boards and the ends of not less than three quarter of an inch boards securely nailed with caught or wrought nails and shall be 17 inches in length, 11 inches in breadth, and six inches in depth in the clear inside. All smoked alewives or herring shall be divided and sorted by the inspector or his deputy and denominated, in or, denominated according to their quality, first sort and second sort. The first sort shall consist of the largest and, cured fish, and best cured fish. Now this might sound kind of boring and abstract, but really what this is, this process is they're, they're creating a, a unified system to inspect and to package fish so that they can be exported. Um, really what capitalism has done here, and critics of capitalism like Karl Marx would say, that the fish is no longer a fish anymore. It has now been abstracted into a number. Right? There is a process by which we capture these fish and they may, must be sorted and organized in a certain way so that they may be traded on an international market. And these fish were sold to places like the Caribbean to feed um, enslaved people uh, who worked on the sugar plantations down there. But you can see this, whereas the people had a personal relationship to the fish uh, to the point by, the, by 1800, the fish are a number that can be traded like anything else. And we live in this later world. We don't live in, this, in the 1644 Dover world. Okay, next slide. So the question is like, why? What what resulted in this change? Why why did how why did society transform in the way that that were rec recognizable to us today? Okay. So especially with what I do, a lot of people because this is a very big and it's a very important question, which is like, when did capitalism start? What were the decisions people made that resulted in creating the kind of the economic, cultural, and psychological world that we inhabit today? A lot of historians, believe it or not, have tried to answer that question. It's a very complicated question. There's a lot of people who have very, very strong opinions on it. Um, I'm sorry today, I'm not gonna resolve that. I think that mostly the story that I'm telling today is a useful metaphor for understanding that process partially. Um, but you can see here, here are some of the, some of the books that, um, that cover that topic, and there, there, there are many, many more. Um, but uh, I want you to, next slide, I have an animation up there is that if you're familiar with the movie Good Will Hunting, there is a scene in a bar where Will Hunting um, encounters a uh, grad, history grad student. It's a very you know, famous movie, and it, they talk in this, like, a lot of academic jargon. But fundamentally, um, Ben Affleck and um, uh, Matt Damon, who wrote that movie, they, they took that, the, those names in, the, in that speech that you might be familiar from, from like a review in the Boston Globe, but if you actually know what they're talking about, they're talking about this debate about when did America transition to a capitalist style economy. Um, the fact that Ben Affleck and Matt Damon picked that debate to kind of demonstrate the kind of intractability of acad academic jargon 
uh, kind of shows that this historians have not been really able to answer this question very conclu conclusively. It's a very complicated question, and it's not really easy to kind of find the smoking gun of like when did society clearly transition from a pre-market society to a capitalist society? Were you know if we went back to 1720s Massachusetts or London, if we walked the streets, would there people be people who are anti-capitalist and pro-capitalist? You know, uh, what were the interests or the people who were trying to push this capitalist society? Historians have had a, you know, disagree on the nature of that. Um, and in general, what we find is just like today, people are just trying to get ahead. They, don't, they weren't really ideologically motivated in the ways that we might want to see them as. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons that this story about fish that I'm going to talk about kind of maybe explains this process um, uh, for us. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the big question is, so the, the, I've talked about fish, right, initially. Why did they go away? Fundamentally, it's because those fish ran into dams or they ran into the pollution that New Englanders threw into their rivers as largely as a result of the mills that were powered by these dams. Um, to give you a sense, so I, I remember I mentioned earlier, the, these fish were very, very important, accounted for one-third of people's yearly meat supply. Very, very important, especially for poor folks. Um, but on the other end of it, New England has, it's, it's a very mountainous, very wet place with many, many rivers and very steep rivers, which can be dammed very easily. And one of the ways you can see like this, the importance of water power and rivers in New England's history is our industrial history. The Industrial Revolution began here in the Northeast. You can see the many old industrial buildings, which have now been repurposed into very luxurious condominiums, right? Um, but one of the ways you can see this is that in the 18, in 1880, in the US Census, New England accounted for one third of all of the United States water power, despite covering only 2% of the nation's surface area. Uh, so New England was the kind of Saudi Arabia of water power um, at that time. And we now think of New England as a very kind of energy poor area, but historically it was a very energy rich area as a result of, of, this, of this water power. Um, and this is important to understand because the fish are a form of energy in the form of like calories, right, that you eat, right? Or even for if you use them for fertilizer, it's still a source of food. Water power or mechanical energy is a, or force is also a, for, uh, a form of energy. And when you look historically about at societies in a general sense and look at how they're structured, you need to, like, their energy source is incredibly, incredibly important for understanding the kind of the, the, the structure of that society. So this debate about fish, whether we should have fish in the rivers or we should dam them and use them for mills, is not just an interesting question about rivers and the shape that they had in this period of time. It's a more fundamental question about what type of society do we want to live in? right? Um, one that where people have access to this resource or one that can be kind of uh, controlled and developed by a small group of people which can lead, lead to, you know, economic growth, right? Um, so this is what the larger um, debate over this issue is. And the thing is, is that you can't have both. You can't eat your cake and have it too in this issue because even today, um, you might be familiar with the issue of migrating fish, especially in the Pacific Northwest and like fish ladders. Fish ladders are, are just not good. They're just, they're n none of them, even though there's been millions of dollars invested in researching them and building them, they're not really effective at getting fish upstream. Um, and in this period of time, people noticed that as well. So you either have to pick the dam or the fish. And this was the real debate that people had in New England communities at this time. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so I'm going to kind of briefly talk about the two arguments or two positions these uh, groups had. One, the millers, the people who were uh, for damming these rivers and developing New England. Um, first off, these mills, and if you go to like Old Saybrook Village or other places, we see these old colonial mills. They had a power capacity of approximately 10 horsepower. So not by our standards very, very powerful. But the thing is, is that we are incredibly spoiled energy energy wise because we use fossil fuels which is you know a much more efficient source of energy with a lot of interesting side effects that we're dealing with right now um, but even though these mills had a horsepower of only 10 um, it cannot be 
underestimated the impact this had on people's lives. Um, these small buildings were the, the engines that really transformed New England and really America's environment, um, more so than human hands, especially in a place like New England where it had a, you had a hard time attracting people to settle here. There wasn't a lot of labor available or it was very expensive. So water power ended up being kind of the motive force that transformed the environment. Um, one of the ways you can see this in terms of these mills, again, despite being very small, in a period of time, like when people lived in the Ethan Allen house, right? There was a world where people worked with their hands and got things done by the sweat of their brow, right? That was that world. These machines saved literally days in a week of labor. So for example, for like cutting wood, sawing wood, the big kind of commodity here, you can cut wood 10 times faster with a sawmill than by hand. Also, it's a lot less stressful. When it comes to grinding grain, in one hour, in a grist mill, you can grind 75 pounds of grain in one of these, in one of these um, grist mills. If you try to grind that with a hand mill or mush it by hand, you can get approximately a half pound done in an hour. So 75 pounds to a half a pound, right? Oh, that's 10 horsepower. My lawnmower is more powerful than that. Like, sure, but in terms of during this period of time, incredibly, incredibly powerful. And one of the ways you can see this as well is that uh, how effective this was, is, is the, I think, when we also look at like environmental devastation or change, we look at like at like the 19th century and people like Muir and Teddy Roosevelt. In the first clear cut in the United States happened here in New England by approximately 1715. 10 miles from the coast of New Hampshire has been has been entirely clear cut. So if you went in 1710, you went to the coast, you would see no trees. It had already been clear cut over 10 miles from the coast. As a, res as a product of these, of these sawmills. Um, More in the King of England. Uh, but that was, that, was, that was for masts. And, and, the, and the colonists, as I'll talk about, just like they followed the law when they felt like it. So they just, they just cut those, they generally cut those up um, as well. Um, so very, very powerful things. And the, the argument that millers and people who were their defenders said was, these machines will develop New England, this colony, they will transform the environment into one more like Europe. Uh, it will create uh, more money, more capital for New, New England in terms of th these machines will allow us to grow. These fish are not going to grow. Um, they're just, they just feed some people. There's not growth potential here like they are with the mills. And they were totally right about that. Um, the other argument, too, is this early kind of capitalist argument about, and we kind of have this, one of the reasons you can see capitalism is like a, it's not just an economic system, it's like a psychological system. It's this, the way in which we inter interact with the world through time in terms of, um, you know, we showed up at 2 o'clock today. The, cl the clock is what determines our life. Also, the idea that you need to be efficient with your time. Right, because you can gather more resources and then grow, even if it's not even in a money standpoint. If you want to grow spiritually or in a fitness standpoint, it's all about efficiency. This is a product of, of the capitalist world that we live in. Um, so here's a cool um, poem from 1772 where you can see people denigrating people who uh, relied on fish. When Tom approached the homely door, his clamorous wife began to roar. You whelp of sin and hell... Where have you been, gallanting whores, or running into alwives' scores? The devil, and you can tell. Thus all day long and every day you squander time and wealth away, and at full freedom roam, whilst I must wallow like a sow, providing for you, your brats, and you, and be a slave at home. So it's this kind of poem that's interesting about a wife yelling at her husband, but it, it really, what's central at it is this idea, like, what are you doing? You're fishing? You're being lazy. Right? That's, that's something that Indians do. Um, a man would work like in a factory and would do things with his time. So you can kind of see Mil how Miller's denigrated people who depended on, on fish. Okay, next slide. So the fishermen had this idea of, that this idea, they, they had lived, they came to New England coming from Europe where the fish had been destroyed in the medieval period um, from those rivers there. Um, and they saw this source of fish, and they said, this is an amazing, beautiful thing. Um, and that not only the economic value of these fish in terms of providing everyone with, with free meat, which is very important um, at a very desperate time of the year, um, there's just something wrong 
there's something ethically wrong about destroying this beautiful thing um, in, in, in a way that I think is very much similar to how current environmentalists see that the environment should be preserved for its own sake, right? So there's this, this argument of like early natural justice, this idea that um, doing this is, is fundamentally wrong on a, on, a, on a basic level. And also in a similar way, although we're not in a kind of capitalist world now, maybe we would call this the kind of universal basic income of the, of the early 18th century, but a, a notion of economic uh, justice, because it's the people who owned mills, who invested in mills. These were the elites in colonial society. Yes, it was producing ec economic development. Yes, it was uh, creating more opportunities for people. But at the end of the day, who, be you know, who benefited from it? From the perspective of many of these New Englanders, it was the upper class, not the poor people. Um, and here's a, here's a petition from William Briggs in Taunton, Massachusetts in 1710. He says, Herring are a sort of fish appropriated by divine providence to Americans and most plentifully afforded to them. People buried them up, barreled them up and preserve, preserve them all winter for their relief. The cry of the poor every year for the want of fish in Taunton is enough to move the bowels of compassion in any man that not, hath not a heart of stone. So again, this idea of uh, these fish, they, they provide an economic benefit, especially to the least among us, and especially for uh, New Englanders in the late 17th century, very Christian people, right? This idea of Christian justice. Here's another petition from 1695 in Plymouth. The blessing of God hitherto had the benefit of the fish called herrings, which come up the rivers near unto us, which are greatly beneficial for the raising of our Indian corn, which without we cannot subsist. And again, the language that people use at this time is that this is, this is something that God has given to us, and that to alter nature is to go against God's will. Right, um, and this is the argument that that people use today. And I would say as well for the many people who are environmentalists and are interested in reviving these uh, fish species. I don't think many of them are eating alewives. Um, it's a very bony, oily fish, or using them to fertilize their their flower beds. It's more. It, it's a very similar kind of, uh, although very different idea about the nat natural justice and the important importance of the of nature being preserved for for its own sake. Okay, so those are the two groups, people who are like pro-millers and people who are for, for the fish. Next slide. Do you not like that fish ladder? <laughs> it's not that I don't like it. It's just not, it's not, as, it's not as effective as like, a, as like an open stream. Uh, I think go back one. I'll get to the conflicts. So we know that the fish, and if we're, uh, we know that the fish go away. And um, if the more cynical among us might say that, you know, the elite capitalists, you know, got together and they, you know, they pushed out the interests of these poor nature-loving people in New England. That's not actually the case. Um, because if you just looked at the archival record, what survives to us in the present day, um, you would see New England states very focused on um, preserving these fish. Because this is something that goes, you know, the idea of natural justice that I mentioned, this is uh, something that people in the medieval period recognized. This is an image of the Magna Carta. I was actually able to see it in person uh, this summer at the British Library. So the Magna Carta actually uh, mentions fish passage. And English common law right, also protects the right of people to have access to this, this resource because rivers were a commons uh, space. And I just kind of, just to give you a sense of this, I, I had a list here of, all the various mill and, and, and fish acts that were passed by the various colonies. You can see with Massachusetts, I think, was it like eight different laws between 1700 and 1760 trying to preserve fish in the colony. So legal, like English common law, is based on precedent. And precedent uh, dictated that, that people had a right to these fish and that dams needed to be opened to, to open them up. Um, so if we just look at the archival record, right, oh, it seems that these people really cared about fish. Why did they go away, right? It's a kind of interesting kind of whodunit. And to be honest, it's not, there's not really much archival evidence to explain what actually happened. Next slide. So when we look, and the, the thing is, is that um, especially in the 1700s and 1600s, the records are not uh, nearly as good as they are in the 19th and 20th century. But I have co compiled a list of confrontations and conflicts 
between fishermen and mills over these issues. Um, fundamentally, what happened was that the, the, the law was that you had to give passage for the fish. The millers were not interested in doing that because they needed the water power to run their mill. To open up a dam meant that they had less water to use for their own purposes. Um, and frequently they would uh, get away with it or try to get away with it. Um, and here's a couple examples of, of basically millers breaking the law and or like ordinary New Englanders using vigilante action to tear these dams down um, in the 1700s. So the first is uh, Timothy Sprague of, from seven, the 1720s in Malden, Massachusetts. A really kind of interesting story. He uh, was damming a river there, and the local people did not like it. So in the middle of the night, um, an armed posse of people uh, tore down his dam and also stuck, you know, basically broke the machinery of his mill for good measure, too, in opposition to his mill. So what he did was uh, Sprague built a um, like little cabin near the dam and actually hired somebody to watch it, that person was threatened uh, with his life, you know, his life was threatened when he caught the people who were, had weapons the next time Sprague rebuilt his dam. Uh, my, the favorite, my favorite part about this is that uh, destroying a mill was, uh, mills were public, considered public buildings, and in most New England colonies, destroying them was a capital crime, okay? So you did not want to be caught doing this. Um, this did not apply to um, people who were juveniles or Indians. Um, they could not be charged in a, in a court of law. So um, in 1728, um, a group of 14-year-olds were, were, were he, Sprague taught, caught these 14-year-olds tearing down these, this dam. And when asked, uh, why are you doing this, uh, they had said they'd been hired by other people who said they were so young, nobody would hurt them for so doing. Right? So if you want to do something illegal, just hire some kids because they can't be prosecuted for it. Um, Roger Hooker on the Farmington River in Connecticut in the 1750s, he bought an old uh, a, a mill that had been in disrepair, and he repaired the dam and made a total wall across it you know, and prevented the passage of fish. Local people did not like this. Um, initially, a mob tried to burn down his mill. Uh, he was able to fend them off. Um, but then again, because uh, the people who were opposed to the dam were, uh, did not want to be uh, prosecuted, they actually hired local Indians who also were not a fan of the dam. So one day, um, Hooker uh, comes out of his house and sees a group, like 30 Indians with uh, uh, pickaxes and shovels, destroying his dam. And there's nothing he can do about it because you can't prosecute Indians in Massachusetts court at this time. Um, one of the reasons I think there is like so little evidence, even though we, you know that these were super uh, contentious issues in these communities, is that when people are breaking the law, they do not really want to leave any physical evidence of it. So finding these examples is really, really hard. Um, the reason why, ultimately, even though the law was on the side of fishermen, the reason why they ultimately lost is because these, in, these, these migrations are incredibly delicate. They're very beautiful things, but the fish are very vulnerable that they all have to go into this very narrow place where they can be easily caught. That's the benefit of it. But at the same time, if you block a river at any point, you can destroy the entire migration. Um, and studies have shown, so like we might think of like salmon, right? They're the most charismatic. They, they jump over obstacles. But like sturgeon, alewives, herring, they um, rely on speed to get over obstacles. So they, don't, they, don't, they can't jump out of the water. Um, so even studies have shown if you block a river and it's like even five feet high, that will destroy an entire population. So we're not talking about like the Hoover Dam, right, on the Concord or Merrimack Rivers at this time. But even then, these small pre-industrial dams um, have the potential to destroy them. And uh, there's this great example of this guy of Chris Osgood in Billerica, who was a mill owner, and in defiance of the law, dammed the entire Concord River. And it's the one time like fishermen overcame him, but that's only because over the span of like 15 years, like in six different times, they not only tore down his dam, they took Osgood to court, Osgood countersued. Um, it was a whole mess, but only after 15 years of, of doing that, were they able to open the dam up? The consequences of Osgood keeping his dam up for that long on those fish populations, without question, destroyed probably at least 50% of the original migration. 
right? So this kind of, uh, the, this litigation really prevented, um, the, the basically resulted in the fish declining over time. And also, in general, it kind of explains why the people who really depended on the fish, the poor, um, couldn't really advocate for themselves. They're the least likely to afford or have access to uh, going to legal, uh, legal recourse or going to court. Hard to get them because they're tr trying to take care of themselves to organize politically at this period of time. So this really targeted disenfranchised people. There's a really interesting example of this guy named William Wetherill in uh, the 16 in around 1700. Um, he wrote this petition in Taunton because they were also having another debate about this dam issue. And he had actually been arrested in 1664 for tearing down a dam. So he was like a pro fish guy. But this is what he said in 1700: "The people are multiplied." And as many fish as ever there were, it could not supply one-tenth part of the people. Instead of a source of relief, the fish are now primarily a means to create quarrels and lawsuits, declaring we are really better without them. So generally, it was the right thing to do to protect these fish, but it was a real pain in the neck. Um, and ultimately, these, while people are having these debates, the, the rivers are not open, and the fish populations are continuing to suffer. Um, next slide. So what ultimately happens? When does this decision happen? I think when people also, when you generally learn American history, like when does capitalism start or this capitalist uh, revolution happen? It's usually in line with the uh, Industrial Revolution in the early 19th century, in New England, maybe the 1790s. What I'm saying with my research is that this capitalist sentiment was basically, this conversation was happening not in the 1790s or 1810, it was happening more like 1715. And that the decision, more or less, in my opinion, based on my research, is made by um, the 1740s. That New England, New England states, or New England colonies are, as a policy, much more in favor of economic de development and the kind of uh, capitalist values that will result in creating the society that we're going to talk about. And so this is, this is, the, this is the way it happens. Um, and this, it's, this story was hard to find because, it, again, when people break the law or want to ignore the law, they don't really write it down. It's only by looking at these events, like in total, as a region that I kind of saw this. First off, I mean, fundamentally, the reason why the fish were not well preserved is because there was no authority to do so. There was no conservation network or system or authority in colonial America. Um, what New England was uh, very proud of was the autonomy of local communities. Uh, you know, town halls, right? We're in town meeting day in Vermont. It's something we still celebrate today that's coming up very soon. Um, but anyway, so for example, there was fish wardens were, um, were elected each year to enforce the fish laws to preserve the fish. You look very quickly that most of these fish wardens were often elected in certain towns that were more a fan of mills because they promised not to enforce the law. And there was no way to bring that to Boston to bring any recourse. Um, also, uh, if basically there's recourse for that in the law, because basically saying, well, if the fish wardens don't, don't do their job, then you can bring local justices of the peace to adjudicate and enforce the law. The problem is, is that justices of the peace were largely an honorific position. Um, it was basically a, a position of uh, basically saying, I'm an important popular person in the community. Um, enforcing the law, well, that's a, that's a bonus. Um, and the justices of the peace, in terms of effectively getting to a place when, a, when fish were blocked, not very reactive to that. And also, these guys didn't have any training um, in terms of understanding how these ecosystems worked. You know, there weren't a lot of people, there weren't a lot of wildlife biologists in the 1700s, but people intimately knew their, their environment, and they knew what these fish needed. So if you have local people who are complaining, saying, hey, this fish ladder is insufficient, and you get a justice of the peace who's like from the same county, People will say, well, the fish ladder looks good enough to me. When in fact, it may just be, it may be totally you know, in, um, not capable of ri rising the fish. The thing is that these ecosystems are very delicate. Even today, like if you look at like when herring can go over obstacles, like it has to be a precise type of speed for them to go up, right? People knew that at the time, but the local law enforcement was not educated on this in a way that, that we might be familiar with. Like the Department of, in Maine, the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is the one. I, what's it called in Vermont? The people that, law enforcement for nature? Department of Fish and Wildlife. Department of Fish and Wildlife. There was no kind of uh, uh, system like that. For me, the really important law that, sh that 
uh, shows this shift legally in this, and also this kind of demonstrates this larger shift toward capitalism is this, uh, the 1746 Mill Act. As I, there was like nine of them. The 1746 Mill Act um, basically said that a county court can first off determine if fish still pass up a pit river or not. By that time, it's, it's basically acknowledging that in most places of New England, the fish have already been destroyed, right? And that these laws are not, do not go in effect, should not be put in effect because the, the, the fish are already gone. Even then, though, a county court can determine if the fish are there or not, which, if the county court is politically more in favor of the mill interest, they're more likely to be persuaded than that than the, than the other way. So they're not necessarily an objective source. And also, in the 1746 Mill Act, local communities, if so, for example, if I had a disagreement with one of you saying, hey, you're not, you're not following the law, you're supposed to create passage for the fish, if the miller could say, well, my mill is of more benefit for the fish, and I'm going to go to court, and then ultimately a judge can determine. Instead of saying, like you, like, you have a right to fish, like it was all the way back to the Magna Carta, you can now say which is of more benefit, the mill or the fish. And the reason why this is important, too, is that the, um, these, these fish migrations go up rivers, and many, they go through many towns. So many people in many different communities share a single river. And all it does is it takes one town to say, we value the mill more than the fish, and then the entire migration is destroyed, right? Uh, so it's kind of, that leads to a cascade of, of changes. So especially if we look at New England at this period of time, people who live closer to the coast, those are the older communities that are more developed, they're more likely to be in favor of mills than fish as opposed to people who are further onto the interior. And basically what happens is I don't think people realize when they pass the 1746 Mill Act that, oh, we're making this huge decision. But by basically open, giving people the ability to ignore the law in this way, um, it leads to the fish being destroyed across all of southern New England. And uh, next slide, leading to the consequences that I'm going to talk about next. Um, so what's the consequences? So if you're like in an upriver town that values fish, but a town downriver, you know, stops enforcing it, the fish go away. That means, you know, uh, one third of your meat supply that you depended on for one of the year, you need to replace that in your income, in your, in your uh, you know, yearly salary somehow. That means, like just like today, you need to get a second job, okay? You need to get a, you need to get a different job. At this period of time, it would be developed either working for someone else as a servant or kind of a, as an apprentice. Uh, developing a skill where you make things where you get paid in a wage, right? Um, this is, again, moving from this moral system, moral economy, to a capitalist system. Very important in that. Um, and this, it also is the beginning, basically, too, of saying uh, with the, this, these laws allow for the destruction of fish. So even though there are people through the, the American Revolution and through the early 19th century in New England who are saying that fish should be saved, they're a smaller and smaller group because the fish are slowly going away. The, so basically what mill owners do is they kind of put their finger on the scale by saying like, hey, we gave the opportunity for you for the fish to go up, but they're dying somehow. We don't know why. Therefore, like if there's fewer fish, the argument to preserve them is less and less. And the benefit of developing mills, like the one you can like see here and you can see all throughout New England, is, is greater and greater. And this leads to, I mean, traditionally when people look at this issue, um, like, um, what was it, Horowitz's like, transformation of American law, which is like, generally the, the text would, people would give you on this topic, they say this transformation happens like in the 1820s, where the U.S. government or the U.S. federal government really decisively sides with uh, development over protection of commons rights. I'm saying that this happened at least actually really 70 years before that. Uh, but because of this, this does lead to the transformation, the interpretation of American law in the early 19th century, which in essence privatizes rivers, because it's this idea that if rivers are privatized, people will be more uh, incentivized to develop them, and which they are. And this leads to you know the, the huge mill structures in places like Manchester, New Hampshire. I mean, you can see it on the Winooski River here uh, in Burlington, um, all, all over New England and all over. The United States. So I've, I've, I've talked about this really quaint story in like northern New England about little herring and how they help people like fertilize their fields. I mean, it's interesting. But the, like the real, I think, significance of this is that the reason why New England in particular is important is because the jurisprudence or the legal tradition of New England 
is replicated in the US federal government. And then that, the kind of precedent that is established here, then goes across the United States. So the legal justifications for damming rivers in Washington state in the 20th century follow the logic legally from this period of time, right? So the thing that's important to recognize too is it's not, um, it's not like in 1746. These communities were just as divided as we are today about capitalism, whether it's good or bad. And I don't think in 1746 they really understood the like what they were doing, the consequences of what they were doing, which is why we should blame the fish, right? We should blame the fish for not being more resilient and able to survive the, the, this type of uh, the, this type of attack on their their ecosystem. But ultimately, like the the argument I'm trying to make here is like, who do we blame for capitalism, right? Who 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 like was it 1746? Which guy was it? It's much more complicated than that. In many ways, like. Nature made this decision that human beings were like, hey, we want to accommodate the fish and the mills. Let's see what happens. And the, the fish disappeared, right? So in many ways, nature kind of made the decision for people at that time. Um, and one of the reasons, you can, going back to like George Perkins Marsh and what I talked about at the beginning of this, this, this uh, talk, is that in the 1860s, you, states like Vermont are hiring people like Marsh to, it's like, oh my gosh, the fish are going away. What was happening in Vermont was basically what was happening in Massachusetts just 60 years later. And Marsh is one of the first people to recognize this. This also was recognized um, uh, in Massachusetts by a guy called Theodore Lyman. Um, and this really, like I said, sparks the environmentalist movement in the United States. And one of the, they, they recognize in the 1860s, this is what we need to do to bring the fish back. But these mills are so central to our economy and way of life um, that we can't restore the fish economically, right? There's the, the, you know, the population in the 1700s was tens of thousands of people in, in college. Now, now we have millions of people. These fish will not benefit um, us in that way. So in the 1860s, you couldn't really restore the fish because economically that was just insane. The economy of New England was based on water power at that time. So last slide bringing us to the 21st century, is um, river restoration, which is a really popular thing throughout New England and really the United States, uh, where people are tearing down dams and bringing these fish populations back. And, I mean, it's a really amazing story. Um, and when I learned about this as an undergraduate, it actually kind of sparked my interest in this larger project because people were saying, like, oh, we're bringing back allies to the Kennebec River the first time in, like, 200 years. And my question was, what happened 200 years ago? And I, no one could really give me a straight answer at that. You know, it's like, eh, colonialism. Um, you know, stuff happened in the past. Um, fish are gone. Uh, but what's interesting, it's really an amazing story. It's great seeing these fish come back. But we, the people who are in favor of this thing, usually environmentalists, frame this as like restoring justice to, this, to fish that were taken away from people. And that's a very cute story. But really what I think is that we're not restoring like we're restoring the fish, but we're creating rivers in a new way, just in the way that millers did. Because historically, for all of human history, rivers have been a source of work, of energy. Um, now, rivers are sites of recreation. They're largely spaces uh, that are, you know, they're retired. We go canoeing on them because they make us feel warm inside. Or we like looking at them because like, ooh, nature, doesn't that look cute? That's why we value rivers. That we like the idea of fish coming up. There's like ecological benefits which are great, but they have like zero, not zero, but next to, next to zero economic value, right? So what I'm saying, I'm not opposed to that. It's just people often frame what we're doing as like going back in time. I think what we're actually doing is actually creating nature in a, in a new way, just in the way that, that Millers were um, in, the, in the 18th century. And I love if, you, if you're familiar with Winooski um, on the river there, there's this amazing, uh, for me as an environmental historian, sign that says power dam, and then natural area, right? Uh, right, because nature is the is the is the is the falls on the left. The dam that is not natural is on the right. I mean, I would just invite us to think like, what is nature exactly? Is the dam ne not necessarily natural? And is it also natural to have like a falls like that where humans do not interact with it in any way other than looking at that? Is that that that's what nature is to us um, in the 21st century, which I think is something that we should probably um, uh, interrogate a little bit more. So, great, so that's, um, the, that's my talk. 
Um, I just wanted to just kind of conclude by saying this. this is a really complicated story, but I think by looking at these, this story of these fish and how they go away, it's a story of um, people's actions um, in the environment and the unintended consequences that they had on the future. I don't think people really, really appreciated um, how the, the legacy, their, their decisions people made in the 18th century would have in the future. There's an economic um, term called path dependency about how decisions you make limit the number of decisions you can make in the future. And this is an example of that. The decisions people made in the early 1700s limited the options that their descendants had and created a world by the early 1820s that would have been utterly unrecognizable to them. Whether they would have been a fan of it or not, I don't know. But uh, it's one of those things where I think in general we need to be much more self-aware of um, the, the, the ways that we interact with the natural environment and the consequences that we'll have in the future rather than doing it for political or economic expedience in, in our own time. Great. So that's all I got. And if you got, got some questions, I'm happy to, happy to take them. I'm going to stand up here next to you so that I can try to manage the chat box. So if, okay. if you're on Zoom and you have any questions, please throw them in the chat box, and then I'll be able to read them off to the, from the chat box to you. And if you're here in person, you can just raise your hand if you have a question. Would you like to start? How old fashioned. Land use. How would you integrate land use into your talk and the other impact of the Mill Act, which mm -hmm. wasn't only about fish? So yeah, yeah. obviously for uh, the purposes of like making a talk here, yeah. uh, you, you'll have to buy my book when it comes out. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I'm, see I'm not going to answer your question until you buy the book. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so you're totally right in the sense that um, one of the things that Marsh observes in the 1850s is the reason why the fish are not returning is not just because of the, the mills, it's because of the clear cutting of the surrounding area, uh, of the clear cutting of the surrounding area, right, which affects everything. Goes back to the point I did make, though, about how rivers, right, by looking at rivers, you can s understand the entire ecosystem. And a big part of that was the water mills, right, that um, were powered by river power that enabled the clear cutting of, of those spaces. So it's, no, it's, you're totally right and it's totally interconnected. And the mill acts were also like concerned with a lot of things such as like flooding of land and things like that. So you're, t and there's a lot of people who've looked at it from that angle. So you're, you're totally right. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Um, uh, Luna, maybe you could help us with the next question. Somebody has a question on Zoom. They're wondering if we could um, invite them to unmute and ask the question on there. Um, while we're getting the technology set up for that, um, there is another question that just came into the chat box uh, right. by Elise Garriette, who's actually our speaker next month. So um, stay tuned for me to announce more about that. But Elise is asking, um, are you advocating that we keep dams or not? I mean, so this is a complicated issue, and it's one that each community needs to, like, make for themselves uh, about, I think, especially in the 21st century, we need to ask the question about what are rivers and what are their value to our community? Um, and that's <laughs> not for me to answer. It's, it's ultimately for people to decide what that is. Um, I would say, generally speaking, in the Northeast, the most, the vast majority of the dams that are out there are 150 plus years old and have literally no purpose um, in our own time. So people, I'm, I'm less sympathetic to people who say like, well, it's really cute looking. It's like, well, it has a devastating impact on the ecosystem. At, at the same time, I mean, one of my favorite environmental history essays is by Richard White. It's called, um, Are You an Environmentalist or Do You Work for a Living? And um, it's one of those things where it's like very easy for like Sierra Club people with, you know, you know, very fancy college degrees saying that we need to bring in the fish while ignoring like the hundreds of jobs that they create in paper mills. 
right? So it's it's really dependent on you know what is what how should this river benefit our community? And those are questions that um, people need to make for themselves, right? So. seems to me that uh, uh, that the building of dams and what came with them is what gener it was generally considered progress. More people, more wealth, the society has more wealth, more goods can be created. And it's not that I'm advocating for that, but it seems to me that was one of the major outcomes or the results of these of, 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 of the building of the dams and other things like it and uh, I wonder if it's possible to continue with that uh, in that uh, in, in that direction is it desirable to proceed in that direction and is it possible to continue with that in in that direction without uh, destroying nature even more than we have done so already So, I mean, the whole, um, like, zero growth uh, is a really interesting movement, and, you know, and, and I, I mean, as interesting as it is, I do not have an answer for, again, the future of the planet, right, uh, and direction we should take. Um, I, I hope, like, this, this uh, history gives, like, what history should do is give people perspective on how we got from there to here, right, and hopefully a, a richer sense of, you know, a, a more developed and more complete understanding to those very complex and deep questions. But I think you're totally right, because it was the, the whole transition from a moral to capitalist economy is this idea of a growth-based kind of society, which, I mean, apart from the environmental limitations you, you raise, I mean, totally true. But on the other end of it, too, is like the quality of life for ordinary people is, is just not even comparable as a result of it. Um, I think one of the things, especially with this story, though, is how this... Um, this story is largely how rivers went from a common space where rivers were something where this is this should be we as a community decide how this should benefit us to as a result as a result of these events by the early 19th century they're privatized by like corporations right and I think the question of like should corporations have you know say on how rivers in the environment which have such a you know uh, cascade of influences on other people is that's I think generally a bad thing <laughs> so so that's I think definitely a big part of that that story I don't talk about land <laughs> only rivers <laughs> this isn't William Cronin all right no I'm just kidding but no you're right uh, no you're no you're totally right I mean it's it's all interconnected for sure Yeah. So um, there's a question from um, a member on Zoom, Matthew. And Matthew, we've invited you to unmute. So go ahead and ask your question. Hello. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, you Professor you Bennett. Um, I really appreciate the talk. There are a number of like fascinating threads in this. Uh, I may give you the, the AAHA presentation um, treatment here um, because there are just so many things that you got into. Um, but um, I'm, I mean, I'm fascinated, fascinated, of course, um, by your um, kind of questions around the origins of capitalism, and, and you allude to many historians kind of like trying to pinpoint the exact moment and um, really kind of coming up with different answers. Um, but largely, um, I, I, I think a lot of historians kind of point to things like uh, the establishment of private property, um, which. Uh, which really means private investment capital, uh, liberal democracy, right? Uh, you Karl Marx said that capitalism will liberate capital from the feudal lords. Uh, um, and the liberal democracy that came with uh, the Civil War and the English Civil War and, 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 and enclosure and, and whatnot. Um, and then the resulting uh, consolidation of labor into urban spaces and, and resulting industrialization. And I, I think it's fascinating that your history um, kind of enters in at that point of industrialization. And, um, you know, and, and so one question I have is, what is the fish, what are the fish doing for uh, industrialization? Because, uh, you know, in, on the one hand, it's, uh, it, 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 it supports it by uh, sorting and organizing and, and so forth. But on the other hand, 
uh it uh you know it needs to be uh, it's against industrialization industrialization because the rivers need to be preserved um and um where, where so what do you think is is the kind of the role of fish in the rise of industrialization i think it's really important because you say this actually story starts back in 1715 rather than the middle of the 18th century and, and if that is the case i think that's like a really kind of important revelation um so i have a lot of other questions uh but i'll just i'll, I'll end it there first off matt great to hear from you shout out to the university of michigan go blue um so that's a that's a great uh, that's a great question um i think like you, you i think you outlined it pretty well right this this debate among historians about like when capitalism begins right you know is it is it the black death is it uh the bubonic plague or in the in the 1300s or is it you know then we talking about 1600s or you know advanced you know when, when capitalism moves into another phase um you're right and it's like if we were telling this story in europe right it would be a different one than the one that that i would be saying now and it'd be the timeline and chronology would would be different so i think the way that i kind of frame it or think about it is that um at this period of time where i think we, this this story captures a moment when people like had a choice about a capitalist future which or a market future and like the moral kind of status quo that they had whereas like i kind of said at the beginning of the talk like we don't have that option really in the 21st century people did have that option i really believe in the in the at least in colonial america in the early 1700s um and the the fish are a great example or kind of vehicle for understanding this thing that everyone kind of agreed was like this is a good thing but everyone also agreed that the mills were like a good thing too and ultimately how mills prevailed in that argument is a, is a way of understanding like how these economic choices in a kind of like meta larger way were were made um because i think a lot of times like people look at like try to look at conclusive choices people made and i think put people into like oh was oliver cromwell pro-capitalist or not uh which are which are kind of generally ahistorical questions i think and um lead to more confusion and misunderstanding than than kind of understanding about the issue but i think i'm not trying to answer that question it's a huge one i just think it's a cute story that i think will hopefully uh i think add insight on this larger larger phenomenon but that's a that's a great question email me any more questions matt if you if you have them okay thanks uh thanks matt um so and thank you also matt for pushing us to um you know be able to offer you to ask the question yourself as we're trying to learn the new system. Um, so there's uh, one last question um, from a member in Zoom. Um, so we're gonna um, invite them to unmute and ask it. But, and then this is gonna be the last question for now. And if you're live in person and have more questions, you'll have the benefit of uh, catching him at the end of the presentation. And if you're remote, um, we'll be following up with you via email um, with ways you might be able to contact the speaker with any other questions you have. So the last question is from Brian. And it's actually, can you hear me? Oh, hi, yes. It's actually <laughs> Beverly with Brian. Um, thanks for your talk. I was curious about the absence of any attention to the native peoples of New England or the continent in your talk and wondered um, whether you've looked at all at the experiences of the native peoples as just fish were extirpated from many of our rivers whether they orchestrated any um, attempts to take down dams as white settlers were moving into the region and um, what is known about the, what must have been absolutely devastating impacts on their livelihood, diets, communities, cultural practices, everything. Yeah, that's that's a great question, and as I said earlier, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to purchase the book because this is this is the uh, this this what I talked about is like the last third, um, and especially the first and second thirds of my book are 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 very much about indigenous people in that process. And one of the things that I'm I'm very much interested in uh, is the colonial wars that took in, that took place here, and also the interactions between colonial people and um, and indigenous people 
in the 17th century. And uh, yes, I mean, these things, it's not just, it's these fish, fish populations, these river fish populations, which were so central to Native American sense of self were being threatened early, already in the 1600s. And um, one of the arguments that I actually make is that, you know, King Philip's War, King William's War, if you're familiar with these early colonial conflicts, um, one of the arguments I'm trying to make is that um, these wars were not necessarily fought about land, which is traditionally how we, we see them. They were actually uh, fought to control uh, rivers because in New England especially, all the resources flow through the rivers, whether it's communication, whether it's trade, or especially fish. So there are many instances of, um, in places like New Hampshire and Maine, Wabanaki's telling colonists, it's like, hey, why are you killing us? And the Wabanaki's will say, it's because you guys blocked the river. And we can't, we can't fish. Although one of the things that's interesting um, that I mentioned very briefly that I definitely want to expand more on is, um, is that story about, I think, Roger Hooker in Farmington, Connecticut, and how he hired local Indians, or someone hired local Indians to tear his dam down. I find several, we, we think about, I think, in the, in the 18th century, you know, conventionally the historiography talks about increased, you know, more developed conceptions of race. Uh, more uh, a more developed kind of apartheid state, especially with not only pe peoples of African descent, but also Native Americans. And that is something that is undeniably true. But in these like weird episodes that I've found, it's really interesting to find how when in the interests of, of white settlers and Indians are the same for preserving fish, how they're like working together a lot of the time. And I think that's a really interesting phenomenon that I want to, to develop more. But yes, you're totally right. Native Americans are, are a huge part of this story. Um, and the, the reason why they're kind of left out in this like la later part is because politically in the, in the early 18th century, Native Americans have been pretty much entirely disenfranchised and they're not, they don't really have the ability to affect, affect legislation in the way they might have uh, in, the, in the century before. But but um, yes, that's a that's a great question and something I want to develop more in the future. Thank you, everyone, for your question. And um, I'm going to steal this from you okay. so that I can say thank you. Yeah. Um, and everyone here can uh, thank our speaker Zachary Bennett one more time for his presentation. Thank you for thank you for that. Um, so if you could all just bear with me both online and in person for a couple more minutes, I would like to make a few announcements about upcoming program that we have. Um, but first and foremost, I uh, realized I forgot to thank our sponsor at the beginning of this program. So our, all of our community enrichment programs, um, we have local sponsorship from different organizations. And uh, right now, Vermont AARP is our major sponsor for this program. So thank you to AARP Vermont for that. Yay. And um, so some of the upcoming programs that Vermont AARP is sponsoring um, is our next month's lecture. So we do this monthly. Our next month's lecture is by uh, Elise Guyette. And I have one of her books here, Discovering Black Vermont. Um, she's not actually going to be speaking about this specific book, but about some newer research pertaining to um, Burlington's black trailblazers in the early history from the 1790s up through the 1860s. Um, so work that um, I believe she hasn't yet like really publicly spoken about yet. So um, some new research about black residents in Berlin, in the city of Burlington. So please join us on uh, the third Sunday in March. I believe that's the 19th, but you could check our website to double check that. March 19th. <laughs> is that what it is? March 19th, thank you, John, at 2 p.m. Um, the other public program that I would like to announce to everyone is our quarterly Homestead Book Club. So we meet four times a year um, and we read fun books and then talk about them and drink tea and eat cookies while we do so. So it's a fun time. Um, the next book up is called The Whiskey Rebels by David Liss. We do sell this book on our online gift shop um, and if you're here in person in our physical gift shop as well. Um, this is a historic fiction novel set in frontier Pennsylvania immediately after the Revolutionary War. And uh, the main characters are dealing with how the idealism of the American Revolution didn't live up to its name um, and how, how that particularly played out in frontier areas, very similar to Vermont during that time. 
So those are our upcoming programs. Um, and then I just want to um, thank everyone here for attending and thank our speaker one more time. And also thank you to CCTV for being our partner here with all the technology as well. We couldn't do this and share this program with everyone without you. So thank you to CCTV as well. Okay, thank you. We hope to see you next month.